right after. All right, so let me just quickly ask, are you able to see my screen as well as to still hear my voice at this point in time? All right, good, good. All right, so I'm seeing the responses, you're saying yes. All right, so good morning again, colleagues. I'm really happy to be here, but you know, I'm even happier that you are here with us today. It is really an important time for us to be able to upskill and to ensure that we provide emphasis or we place emphasis where emphasis needs to be placed. And so today's session talks about the instructional approach to teaching mathematics, and we're taking it from a virtual edition, right? And we'll be following the sub-theme as shared by Mr. Blair, more than talking heads, effective use of technology in the virtually inclusive classroom. All right, so let me just quickly walk you through what it is that you ought to expect in today's session. So as an overview, we want to look closely at promoting interest building in our students, or we want to promote interest building so that our students can be interested in the lessons that we are delivering. We want to look at engendering a positive virtual culture. We want to explore the conceptual engagement of our students and we'll be looking or focusing closely on the instructional approach to teaching mathematics. And then finally, we'll be exploring some supporting strategies for the inclusive classroom. So I hope that you will just tune in and pay attention to what's taking place at this point in time. And from the time to time, you can always just, um, just comment in the chat and Mr. Blair will indicate to me if there's anything that I need that is brought to my attention. So let's go through. Let's start off by painting this picture. I know for a fact that we have the streaming services now, um, Netflix, Hulu, and so on. But before the streaming services, we had to rely heavily on broadcasted uh, series. So from your own experience, or even from the experience of your children, you might find that there might be a particular series on air that is gonna be aired at a particular time of the day, maybe every day for the week. Now, have you ever stopped to consider what is it that you know, compels us to get up and go to that television set to watch a session that starts at 4 p.m. in the afternoon? And what is it that is gonna keep us um, on, our, on edge and wanting to come back for the next episode. Now, I'm sure you have the answer to, the, to that question, and it would be um, more along the line of, because it's interesting. it's interesting. Now, one of the things that I have done with this very question, I decided to ask a few children in my, in my area, and I was surprised when I heard, um, the, I heard two responses, but one response stood out to me more than the other. So we would expect that one would go and watch a, a television um, series because it's, it piques their interest. However, the second response that I got from the, the children would have been that they watch this, the, the episodes because they want to be in the know when their friends are talking about it. So it's not so much that they are really interested in it, but because it's a, a culture where their friends, they're talking about this particular um, show or episode, they want to be able to, to involve themselves in, in that conversation as well. So that's something that we, we want to look into. And I'm thinking of the fact that we have transitioned from face to face and we have been embracing the online um, means of engagement. And it's very similar to a television series. Now, we have to then ask ourselves, if it is that we're engaging students using a virtual means and we would have less control over the fact that they can you know, choose to, to show up or to sign into class, how then do we begin to 
pique the students' interest. So just as how they would show up to watch a television series, they'll be so eager to show up to attend your class as well. And that's the type of thinking that we want to have. Now, in going forward, one of the things that I find in conversations is that we want students to have that innate desire to learn. We want them to be interested all on their own. And that is a good desire to have for your students. But it's also important that we don't allow that to sideline us from what it is that we ought to be doing. And truly, a big portion of the teaching process involves you motivating students. And so we have here this statement, we want to promote and maintain the desire to learn. So in our students, we want to ensure that they want to learn. We want to ensure that we promote that desire to learn. And once we have promoted the desire to learn, we want to now maintain it. And that needs to be a part of our thrust as we prepare our lessons. So beyond just all of the resources that we pull together to engage the students, what is going to be critical to how they assimilate the information would be whether or not it was interesting. So I want to pull now on five areas so as to assist us in promoting and maintaining the desire to learn in our students. And we start off by looking at intellectual engagement. And this is where we are, we are trying to pique the curiosity and appeal to the students as it pertains to the discipline itself. We want them to be interested in the content that is to be explored. We want to also look at emotional engagement where we play a role in looking at the child's well-being while learning their emotional state. I'm sure um, from experience or even observer, observing our consult and conversation with others, you'll find that students don't like to talk in math classes or they might not, they might be shy to respond or to share what they're thinking, especially if they feel that it's wrong. We need to ensure that we engender an environment where it's okay to share, it's okay to be wrong, it's okay if your ideas don't align with my ideas. And that's gonna play a role in building the interest so that students would want to come back for another session. Then we have the physical engagement. And this one is very important for the virtual space because if it is that we, we don't pay attention what might happen is that we become so engrossed with the, the, the technology that we forsake the fact that we have kinesthetic learners. We want to ensure that we cater to them. So while it is that we are using the, the, the technology to engage them, we want to also ensure that we still keep them active and moving behind the scene and behind the screen. We need to also cater to their social um, and well-being. Students and People on a whole, human beings are, are sociable, whether to a great extent or, you know, to a lesser extent, we do require from time to time interaction. And it's very important in the child's life that as they operate now more so um, through this virtual means, they still need to have that, that social bond taking place. And for those of you who have been really behind the computer screen for quite a while now, since COVID, you would at times feel as if you're talking to yourself when you're engaging in your group. So it, it's very important that you cater then to this aspect of the child's needs. And the final here is the cultural engagement where we're ensuring that we give attention to the culture, the background, the environment. So we cannot just take the math, take the content and deliver it in a way where it doesn't fit into the context of which your students are operating. We must take from their environment and pull on their interest. And that is how we're going to overall, with all these factors in play, promote and maintain the desire to learn in our students. So that would have been a quick overview of those five areas. So in terms of intellectual engagement, as well as even social engagement, we can try to pull on things like the, the Kahoot app where maybe at the beginning of the class, you might want to do a game or an activity where you're, you're, you're reviewing um, content covered in the previous class or just to see what it is that your students know so far going into the new topic. This is a nice way of, of, of trying to 
appeal to their interest while at the same time getting the content done. And because of the social nature of this, it can be competitive at times. And so this here would probably pull on the interest of the students. Another thing that we could actually look at too is just pulling on online games and resources that you can bring into the classroom setting. Remember now, we want students to have that inner drive to, to learn, right? But the reality is at times that sometimes you have to be the one to push or to apply that little nudge so that they start to gain some amount of interest. So you can play things like Math Jeopardy. And the good thing about these resources is if you just Google it, you get a PowerPoint template or you get an online version that you can just type in, follow the instructions and type in the information that you want to share and you, and you have a game and you're ready to engage your students. So we want to ensure that while we prepare our lessons for engagement, we want to ensure that we are, we are making it a focus of ours to appeal to the interests of the students. Now, it's very important to note too, that while you work towards appealing to the interest of the students, you want to also ensure that you create a virtual culture, or better yet, a positive um, virtual culture. Now, because this space is new to both you and is new to the students as well, it's very important then that you take the time to create the culture that you want to see. So in the same way, in the same manner in which you would have students um, raising hands to speak and you have students um, respecting the views of others, taking turns, um, sharing of resources, is this the same behavior needs to be applied when you're in the virtual space. And when doing so, you want to then familiarize yourself with the, the technology that you're using and ensure that you spend some time to share with the students as to what is expected of them as well as how is it that they will use the resource or the platform that you, the school is using to engage the group of students, right? But in looking at the virtual culture, I wanna talk about two things. I wanna talk about how you promote your exploration and how you promote your communication. These are two areas that are very vital for the mathematics classroom. Because we want to promote student-centered delivery, Right? We want the students to be the center of the lesson. Because of the shift now to the virtual space, it, it can become quite tempting. It can become quite tempting to, to want to, to revert to being the source of information or the main person delivering. So it becomes teacher-centered if you're not careful. So as you prepare to engage your students um, virtually, you want to ensure that the, 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 the teacher still plays the role as a facilitator, providing the right task, providing for the student the right atmosphere so that they can explore the concepts. Additionally, you have to now continue to promote the willingness for students to communicate because a big part of the mathematics classroom is how students are able to share their thinking and to critique the thinking of others. So the teacher then would have to compose him or herself in such a way that the students are not fearful of sharing, but at the same time, you have established a protocol where students can raise hands, and once they raise hands, they can be acknowledged, and from there, you would allow them to share. You would work through a system that allows students to provide feedback based on what was shared by one student, right? So it's very important then that we, we, we work on the virtual culture. And as we go through the presentation, we'll be talking about the virtual culture and we'll be talking also about those means of engagement that we, we looked at earlier today. All right, so let us, let us continue. Now, when you are going to engage a group of students, you're in the classroom, you're in a physical classroom, face to face with the students, a big thrust for mathematics engagement is when we ensure that the engagement itself is conceptual. A big part of conceptual engagement um, lies within the resources that we utilize, as well as the tasks and the conversations that we have. Now, we want to now transition this desire to ensure that we maintain conceptual delivery to the virtual space. 
bearing in mind that we might not have the same physical resources, but can we strike a parallel so that we preserve that desire to deliver the content conceptually to students? So the three main areas then, when it comes on to conceptual engagement, is going to be one, how is it that as a teacher, you put together your activities so that the students can learn from the process. And when I say learn from the process, it's more of discovery. Even though I am here and I'm virtually engaging the students, how do I ensure that the students, they are the ones who are leading the session, they're the ones who are exploring and coming up with their ideas and, and, and thoughts surrounding the content. Then from there, how is it then that you support this exploration using your questioning techniques? and ensuring that you can still facilitate meaningful mathematical discourse in the classroom. These are areas that we, we, we really want to give focus to, ensuring that you provide the tasks so that they can explore, even though you're in a virtual space, and then ensuring that you're still facilitating the meaningful discourse. And then the final thing about this would be ensuring that you have the right manipulatives for the exploration to take place. And this is where we have to be creative and start to utilize the, the home space, as well as to look at virtual manipulatives that can be brought into the classroom space and used for the actual manipulatives to engage the students. Now, springboarding from this idea of those three areas, uh, the task itself, the type of conversations you have surrounding the task and the resources that you use for the students to explore, it brings us to the statement which undergirds the whole presentation that talks about the instructional approach to teaching mathematics. It says here, because of the abstract nature of mathematics, people have access to mathematical ideas only through the representation of those ideas. So math in itself, in its purest form, can be quite abstract. If I just come and I say to you, boy, I'm going to find the area of a circle, um, and we're just going to tell you that it's going to be pi r square. If I say that to you without any, without any understanding behind those abstract symbols, right? How is it then that a child is going to be able to, to utilize that formula or to use that approach if it is that there's no understanding? So this is saying to us that. Math in itself, it, it takes on an abstract nature, but in order to appreciate abstract nature, there is some connection to a representation for you to appreciate it. And we're gonna walk through this right now um, by looking at the instructional approach to mathematics delivery. And it takes on three parts, and we call it three stages. The concrete stage, representational stage and the abstract stage. As, as we want students to be able to appreciate the abstract nature of math, they need to go through the stages in the, in the delivery process. So you go through the concrete stage, into the representational stage, and into the abstract stage. And that is how the understanding is gonna come about, or the conceptual understanding will come about through the exploration of these stages. So taking the stages one at a time, in looking at the concrete stage, this is where you will have the actual manipulative available for the students to manipulate. This is where you will have the resources and the students can pull it apart, look at it. It can, it can actually be used to deepen their understanding as to what they're exploring. So for example, if I want to, if I'm teaching numbers for the first time and I want, if I, if I just go and I write the numeral three on the board, right? If I write numeral three, what does that mean to a child? When I say three, what does that mean to a child? But if you take something and you begin to compare, you have three objects and the three objects is associated with the symbol and the, and the number name, then the, associ the association that is created allows for understanding of the abstract nature of math. So three, the numeral is abstract in, in nature. 
but the understanding that three as a quantity represents literally three objects, right? Then right there, you, are, you have started the process by, by identifying the concrete resources necessary to bridge this understanding. Now, at some point in time, you need to transition away from the concrete stage and into the representational stage. In looking at the representational stage now, this is where the student plays a role or the learner plays a role in representing their thinking. And it's not limited to anything that is prescribed by the teacher, but anything that the student can pull together that is logical and sound, then it can be accepted. So for example, looking at a diagram to the bottom right of the screen, you'll see here that you have four boxes on the left, five boxes on the right. But then there's, we have some line segments meeting at a vertex and it's coming together to give us a combination of the boxes. So right there, you can see that this is a four plus five being equal to nine. So once it is that the representation is made, the representation is linked to the symbolic stage, which is the abstract stage, where there is no a connection. So because you would have modeled, because you would have modeled, the, the, the understanding of the symbols by creating the diagrams then a connection is made. So when you remove the representational um, stage from it now, what is left is just the abstract stage or the abstract symbols that are here. So when you see four plus five and you say it's equal to nine, that is abstract in nature, but behind that thinking would have been the understanding of the quantity four and the quantity five to give when, when brought together as a sum gives you the quantity nine. And this is important as every step of the way as you progress through math and the different topics that exist within the strands, you have to then take an approach where the connection can be made. You're starting, you're starting off with your concrete, moving into representational and ending with the abstract stage. So we can't start the lesson at the abstract stage. If we start there, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're promoting procedures and the procedures doesn't necessarily allow for conceptual understanding, but conceptual understanding can promote procedure fluency, if you're following me. So now that we have looked at these three stages, we want to be able to facilitate the transition. It's not a, a overnight process. I won't say that you're going to snap your fingers. When you do so, it just works immediately. That's not the case. What it is that I'm really saying to you now is that it's going to start with changing mindset. I know that right now, virtual engagement might be tedious for some, but that's what it is. Anything that is new, once you are going through a phase of change, you're going to come across some roadblocks, but as you grow through the process, you will learn and you will get comfortable over time. So you have to first start by changing the mindset regarding the online uh, engagement. Then you want to do additional research, right? You have, to, you have to research the things that will replace the things that you normally do. So for example, you normally have the dean's blocks, with the students on the table, that's not a reality right now. What can be the replacement? You can always go online and do a little research to see how is it that you can, you can engage the students with the same resources, but virtually. And you might find sites that have some wonderful resources that you can pull on. So we want to take that. And the third thing to note is that you have to come out of your comfort zone. I know that over time we create comfort zones for ourselves. We get comfortable with our practices and we work with it because we are, we're happy and we're seeing the results. But then when there's a shift, when there's a shift in the environment, we have to come out of the comfort zone to adapt and be ready to engage our students in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, right? So let us look at a case here where we can put some things into practice. Let's say that Ms. Davis, who is a great fire teacher, is preparing to engage her students in a virtual lesson, right? And the, the, the lesson that she wants to explore is, is, is adding proper fractions with unlike denominators. 
it is important to note that as a prior knowledge, as prior knowledge, she would have already um, gone through equivalent fractions with the students and would have already looked at the addition of proper fractions with like denominators. Now it is time for the teacher to engage the students with the addition of, of fractions with unlike denominators. So let us say that the teacher, Ms. Davis, decides to approach this task by asking the students to get a sheet of paper. And probably this would have been an instruction given to them before the class started, of course. So to have a sheet of paper available with markers and pencils and crayons and so on. It's a grade five class. And Ms. Davis would say to the students, OK, I want you to use this paper. And this paper represents for you a cake or something, something that, they, that they can divide or share up. And you want to say to the students, no, I want you to remove half of the cake for yourself and a quarter for your friend. And they're to represent this using the paper. Now, a few things come up when we take on a task like this. And bear in, bear in mind that this is how she plans to even start the lesson, just to engage them this way. And right away, you realize that the intellectual engagement is, 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 is in play now because you are trying to get the students to think and to think critically. So they're now utilizing the resources that they have in their home. And even using those resources, you are catering to the physical engagement. So you are getting them to, to move things around, to fold, to think, to color, to draw, and so on. So right away, they're not just looking at a screen, but they're also taking part in the lesson and the activity. Then once it is that you allow students to share what they have done, they open their cameras and they show, they, they, they hold up the, the diagram and they talk about it, that is you allowing them to be sociable. You're allowing them to share and to critique the thinking of others. And then finally, if it is that what it is that you are doing in terms of the drawing is in keeping with their interests and their, their experiences, then right away, there is some amount of caterance to cultural engagement as well. Now, let us look at a sample. So remember now, we're asked to use the, the paper to represent a cake. And in representing the cake, take a half for yourself and a quarter for your friend. Let us say that the child just decides to just yank a paper out of the book, right? And because, you know, resources come in all shape and sizes, the child decides to pull a sheet from the book page, a page from the book, and decide to fold the paper in half, and they shaded the, the half of the paper. And the child decided, but I need a quarter now. And the child folded that paper in half again and then shaded another portion of it. Right there, we can see that the child has an understanding of what a half is and what a quarter is. Now, if you were to respond to this, if the child shaded the half and shaded the quarter, and you ask the child what fraction of the paper is shaded or what fraction of your cake is, is shaded, um, what do you believe the child will be able to tell you the fraction? So what is happening here now, you know, is you have done already fractions. You have done already additional fractions with with with, with um like denominator. So some amount of fraction work was already done. But what is happening here is the child will be able to get the half and to get the quarter. But the knowledge of looking at the paper itself, the child would also be able to pick up on what fraction of the paper is shaded or what fraction of the cake has been taken. And in this case, the child would take three quarters. So right there, before you even get too deep into the lesson, the child would have even added these two fractions together and it would not have explored it in depth as yet. So you're seeing where you have the half and the, and the third and the quarter and the half and the quarter is giving you the three quarters. Second child might do this and this child might want to decorate the edges of the cake because they have to tell them to do a cake and they decided to shade a half of the paper and to label it as a half and to shade a quarter and label it as a quarter. If you ask this child the same question right there, the child will be able to tell you that the total shaded region would be three quarters. And if you allow for questioning, you would get from the child that the half is equivalent to two quarters. So right there, having gone to this activity in adding fractions with 
unlike denominators, you'd have created a relationship that a half is the same or equivalent to two quarters. So you're able now to add the half to the quarter by adding two quarters to one quarter to give you three quarters. And if you see right here so far, I have not gone through any steps. I have not told you to draw a line and find LCM and say this into that, it goes that times and then multiply it by this. I haven't gone that route. That's a procedural approach. But with the right investigatory activities, the students can get to a point where those procedures that we normally do will be something that they would generate as a result of going through this conceptual um, approach to looking at the concepts. Now, let me just play a quick video, and it's, there's no order to the video, but it's just another way or another way, another stage of the, the manipulation. So beforehand, the paper that we looked at earlier would have been, would have been to, to bring about the concrete stage, but I decided to just quickly Google, the first thing I Googled, I Googled fraction bar manipulative virtually, and I found root math, and I was able to just play around. So here am I trying to add a half and a third, All right? So I'm here playing with it, of course. And in playing with it, the, the resource is very helpful. And this would allow for the representational stage to be catered to. So down here at the bottom of the tab, you're seeing where I'm looking at fraction, fraction circles. And I've now gone over to fraction bars. So a child could have used the fraction circle or a fraction bar. But fine, I'm, I'm here working with the fraction bar. I pulled up a whole bar and I pulled up a half bar as well because I'm trying to get my math across. So I also pulled up the one third bar and I placed it beside the half bar, trying to add it, all right? I'm just, I'm just playing around with the, with the resource here. And that's what you need to do as well. You need to play with the resources before you ask the students to use the resources. I just pulled on a one fifth um, portion and it was too long to complete the whole. So I pulled on a one sixth portion instead and I realized that it fits perfectly. So I got the idea that fine, I guess one sixth will be perfect to use as a, as a comparative bar to the others. And I placed a few one six bars down. And in doing this, what I picked up was that I got a total. So the yellow, the yellow bar, which is a half, and the other color, not sure it is, the other color is, is one third. But when I put them together, I was able to align them perfectly with five of the sixes, right? Five, six. So I literally have five, one, six, five, six. So in having the five, six there, I'm now looking to say that, but wait, the two, two, six seems to be equivalent to one third. And I'm also seeing where three, six is equivalent to a half. So that is going to be now my understanding for, for the addition of my, my fractions. I, I, I can see through my representation that I have a half bar and I have a one third bar, but I can't just put them together and say I have a new fraction without, without um, having to a better understanding as to the fraction parts. But I realized that I'm able to better represent it if I use um, one six as my base. So right there, if over time you start to use these resources to, to engage the students, then what you'll find is, they'll be able to transition to say, okay, I'm realizing that I need to have the same denominator. So there's a better appreciation for even the procedures that follow because of the understanding of the fraction sizes and the fraction pieces. So the representation helps to deepen the understanding of the students. Now, outside of this, Outside of this, as we engage our students conceptually in the virtual space, we have to also bear in mind that we have our inclusive classrooms. And we know that there are more severe cases where referral is critical, and from there, the, the required support ought to be offered, right? But in the inclusive classroom, there are ranges of cases that you would want to be able to treat with as a teacher. 
it's very important then that as you try to embody inclusive practices, you will have to at times tailor your engagement, your activities, your tasks, so that each student in the class is being catered for based on their specific need. So it's very important that this becomes a part of our practice. So, so far, we have spent more time looking at the instructional approach, right? But we want to use the remaining minutes now just to see how it is that we need to, 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 to change or to apply strategies that can open up the floor for greater accommodation of the students' learning needs. So three things quickly. We need to vary our presentations. We need to pay attention to the functional skills. And we can apply things on approach such as pre-teach or reteach. Let's go through. When talking about your varied presentations, I, I want to talk about three areas. One is multiple means of representing content. You would need to be able to cater to your diverse cast of students. And in doing so, you want to then be able to change how you represent the content that you're delivering. There are times when you might want to do some amount of reading, you might want to do a video, you might want to share an animation, you might want to do a task, you might want to do a graphic organizer, but you want to ensure that how you represent your information is not just one approach that you take. You might be comfortable doing things a particular way. You might want to just do a PowerPoint presentation all the time, or you might want to do a video based on comfort, but you have to also ensure that you are varying your approach so that each child and their little niche is catered to. The multiple means of action and expression is more on the part of the student. This is where now you are, you are tailoring the opportunities so that the child can choose an approach that best suits their need as an action for them in the class. You might have a child who maybe talking is not their, their strong point, but they want to write. You might have a child who writing is not their strong point, but they can draw and explain it. You have to be open and aware of the various um, tendencies of your students and be able to treat with that as you engage them. And the final one would be the multiple means of engagement. And this just talks about how now you, you interact, how is it that you interact with the students? Do you interact with them as an entire group? Can they handle the whole group discussion? Are there times when you need to do smaller group discussions? Is there a time when you probably need to lead with only questions and they respond and the students take, take a leading role in delivering? Is, is it a thing where you provide facts and you have them critique the facts? But it's you ensuring that you're changing your approach, varying your presentation so that you cater to the needs of the students. In looking at the functional skills, we know the basics, reading, writing, speaking, listening, communicating on a whole. But as it is that you want to engage your students in this virtual space, it might be a thing that reading is difficult. How then do you ensure that the reading itself doesn't, play, doesn't stand in as a major barrier to probably the exploration that you want the students to do? So you might well consider allowing students to read aloud for the purpose that others can benefit. Are you reading what you have written on, on, your, on your, your, your work for engagement? Writing might be difficult, and in this case, probably typing. Can we then speak to parents to get extensions on the application so that they can do a talk to speech thing, a, 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 a speech to text situation? And you might have communication issues and barriers that you want to overcome. And in doing so, you want to ensure that you have the environment properly primed so that these students can communicate in that space effectively. But then you have the math side of things where it might be a thing that um, numeration, um, numbers might be a, a, an, an issue for the student and you have a con to explore. Can you consider bringing a calculator into the process where the calculator doesn't take away from the learning, right? It's just a tool to aid that individual. It could be a thing that students are unable to, to, to pick up on common shapes. And from there, it might, might mean that you need to label your shapes so when you're delivering the math lesson or keep that constant reminder as to what shapes you're working with. 
And there are times when students can't handle too much information, right? So how then do you tailor the information? And one quick, ex quick example would be when you're teaching and you're on one particular sheet and then you transition to the second sheet, but there's information on the first sheet that needs to be brought into the second sheet. You have to then think about how do I get that information as a summary on this new sheet that I don't leave these students behind when we're transitioning the work itself, right? And then we talk about things like pre-teach and reteach. There are times when based on the students, you might need to engage them a little earlier um, before the class starts, but you don't necessarily have to be the one to, to be there face to face. It could be that you, you, you do a pre-recording. You might do a, a, find a video to share or an audio file, right? You might have reading material that you give to certain students or even all students ahead of class so that by the time you get into the class, you can really begin to, to delve into it because they would have had this information um, beforehand so they could get a head start. And then you have the reteach process where you might want to strategically um, work your scope and sequence so that as you cover topics and you're moving on, there is still reinforcement of all topics while engagement in new topics. And you can share uh, video files, um, again, and audio files for the reteaching process, where after you have taught, you still send files that can be used, video, audio, reading material that can be used to either reinforce what was done already or as an extension for those who want to push ahead, right? Um, final activity, which is just a case in trying to pull it all together now. So Ms. Davis, who is still the grade five teacher, has a class of 24 students. And in her class, there is one student who has a severe stutter. There, is one, there are two students who struggle with retaining new concepts and one student who is visually impaired. As a solution to this, and you bear in mind that it's very important that you know your class, know your students. Once you know your students, you are in the, you're, 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 you're begun to put things in place by just knowing them. So knowing this, Ms. Davis, in preparing her class, um, the, the, the chat itself will be utilized along with the microphone. So the child who, is, who has a stutter, the child who has a stutter can then utilize the chat feature and much attention is paid to the chat so that this child is not left out. So when students are sharing their thoughts, the teacher is cognizant that I need to go on and share what, what um, this child has to, to, to share from the chat as well. Content related videos, video files are shared with students prior to the lesson and extension videos are provided for in, uh, independent study. So right after the lesson, you have, you have video files provided so that students can, can get in the, the necessary work. So you have two students who have a hard time retaining, they need more practice so that they can build their retention. So having added video files or probably having added material for them to work with would help those two students, right? And then we have here um, large friendly fonts will be used for all sessions. So knowing that the child is visually impaired and the, the monitor might be a challenge, then you want to have more um, larger diagrams, you want to avoid using small fonts and probably reading aloud as well would be an important thing for this child who is visually impaired. So what I'm saying to you is that the, the spectrum, it exists, it's a wide spectrum from mild to severe, but what is important is that you, you cater to the student's needs. So in, in summary, colleagues, in summary, we must start off by promoting and maintaining the desire of our students to learn. We want to ensure that we put effort into trying to build the interest of the students in the subject of mathematics, right? But in doing so, we have to engender a positive virtual culture where the students can feel comfortable to share and to not be ridiculed for doing so. They can share freely in that space. At the same time, you want to ensure that your delivery is conceptual. So we utilize the three stages of the instructional approach to delivering mathematics, which is the concrete stage, transition to the representational stage, and finally, the abstract stage, looking for virtual resources that you can pull on. And finally, you want to ensure that you are catering to the diverse needs of the students in the class. So you have strategies that will allow for them, for them to learn comfortably 
So you want to vary your presentation as you deliver to the students. You want to ensure that you are providing them, right, with the resources so that you can do a, you can do a pre-teach or a re-teach situation. And important is that you are catering to their functional skills. What are their limitations and what can you do to support them as you deliver? I hope that for this session, you are able to garner much or, um, for your teaching. And I hope that um, you really took it away today and you will be using it in your classroom. Thank you for listening. And I hand over now to Mr. Blair. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Edgehill, for a very informative session. Um, I'm sure people have lots of questions. So I just want to share with you our protocol going forward. Um, since you're all um, muted, because we don't want everybody speaking at the same time, I want to ask you to do, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll acknowledge you and unmute you so that you can ask your question. All right, so that question time starts right now. Okay, I see Yannick Dobson has a question. You can unmute your mic and speak, Yannick. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Informative session. Um, lots of practical ideas that can be put into play as it relates to teaching math. We have been thrown into having to embrace virtual teaching learning and math in itself can be a very complicated subject area. It's not one of the areas that children really run on to and, and, and embrace. Virtual learning is, a, is like a little bit new because we have to be dealing with it. Are there any um, plans in place for more sessions of this nature where teachers will be guided through as it relates to passing on information, teaching math topics, which we would have been accustomed to being face to face, um, hands on with the children, physical assistance. Is there a, are there any plans to really re-educate us as teachers as to really how to do math, to teach math in a virtual space using all of the, the, um, the pointers that we would have received from our presentation here and additional information because it's necessary. It's really necessary. All right, awesome question. I really appreciate that you have taken it there. Um, one of the things that we have been doing so far, I can I can speak to I can speak from the national math program perspective through the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, that we have been conducting sessions already in term one that looks at teacher empowerment in the delivery of mathematics. These sessions would have been conducted um, throughout term one, and all of the recordings for these sessions are actually on the Facebook stream for the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information's Facebook page. So you can find the previous sessions there. For term two, I know that the team right now, um, they're meeting tomorrow, and they're, they'll be continuing the planning process so, so as to further our sessions. What we have done so far in the sessions gone would have been to look at the virtual manipulatives, utilizing the, the, the Google resources to deliver mathematics to the students at the grades one, three level, four to six, the lower secondary and upper secondary. So once you go back to the feed, you can find those, but I know that a bulletin will be coming out um, later this month, sharing with, sharing with all our stakeholders um, the, the, the sessions to be held for term two. But I'm glad that you asked so that others can look out for the bulletin to come, as well as to go back to the ministry's Facebook page to look for the sessions already conducted. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Blair, there, there are more hands. Thank you very much, Ms. Dobson. Um, I'll go to Shereen Williams School first.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Mr. Edgehill, are you able to hear me clearly? Loud and clear, Ms. Williams. Oh, okay, sir. Um, excellent presentation. First of all, um, I was really I was really impressed, especially when you spoke about catering to the students with the different diversities within the classroom context. Hence my question. What we know that we have in most of our schools an inclusive classroom. We are also well aware that there is an issue with the teaching of mathematics and with online education, the gap as will inevitably be wider. What strategies or what um, actions does the ministry plan to put in place so that we can further enlighten our teachers on how to try to close this gap before we even return fully face to face? And um, what resources would they have available for teachers who need it now so that they can impart students using more diverse strategies. All right, not a problem. So we understand that COVID would have truly impacted the learning process and would have caused for us um, a, a large learning gap and loss of learning time and content. So one of the things are a combination of things have already been in play and it's just now for us as educators to access those resources would be one, the fact that they would have done over the curriculum, they would have done a modified curriculum document catering to the, the major objectives to be covered for this academic year. So this is a subset of the original curriculum and this would have been sent out in a bulletin to all schools where schools are supposed to teach the, the, the students from this curriculum document so that once it is that you have covered these topics, then it would have been sufficient to, 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 to treat with these students when, once they move on to the next grade level. In addition to these resources, however, there has been the, the rollout of our, our online resources. So for example, One Spot Media would have its school, its, its, its school time and school time math channels where we have 24 hour sessions going on for math and other subject areas where you can go in and you can watch and you can pull from these videos and use them um, as you see fit or use the concepts as you see fit. Additionally, there has been the preparation of lesson plans for grades one through to nine for all math topics from the original NSC itself. And that is in circulation as well and can be accessed to and utilized. We, we have also the, the our sessions being aired on um, Ready TV, PBCJ. For the CSEC students, we have the TVJ's class time. So, and these sessions are also uploaded on YouTube as well. And the ministry has shared recently in a bulletin a link to their learning kit resources. They have been partnering with the Clean and the Observer to provide kits to the schools. And once it is that you have not been receiving those, that's the case, then it's to reach out through to your, your, your EO through the principal to ensure that those resources get to you as well. But in the most recent bulletin, they had also the links to these resources. So there are a lot of resources being pumped into the system. It's just a matter of, of reaching out to accessing them. And training will continue because even with our, our leaders, we have our leadership mathematics series going on. Um, we're going to resume this term again for, for HODs, senior teachers, as well as for principals, vice principals. So there are, there are a lot of resources putting together. And TJ is also doing sessions as well. So it's not a perfect system, but with all of the resources provided and the, the effort on the part of each individual, we can begin to, to close that gap. It might not be perfect, but we can close the gap so that later on, when things are, are better for us, we can we, we have an easier transition as we work to, to treat the students in the region and in the country. I hope that response covers some of the, the queries that you had though, Ms. Williams. Yes, sir. We'll talk about the other part afterwards. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, before I ask Felicia Wright to speak, I just want to remind you that there's an evaluation format I want you to fill out. I reposted it in the chat. 
because it, it was posted earlier, but you might have been lost with everything else that has um, gone on. All right, so please remember to fill that out. Um, the link is in the chat. Um, Ms. Wright, you can unmute and speak. Kalisha Wright. I realize um, while they were doing your presentation, on your left arm um, with the equivalent fraction, I realized on the left hand of the screen you had at the top. Is that an app um, that um, we can use to teach fraction fun can um, give um, student activities? Because um, most times students um, have been are having challenges with um, equivalent fraction and fraction of and fraction and a whole. Is that an app we can use to um, help the students to better understand fraction, or they can use it to better understand fraction? Most certainly, that app is not an app. It's more of a website. What I did, I, I wanted to. Uh, what I wanted to do, I wanted to to see if I can find things easily. So what I did, I just typed in fraction um, manipulative online, and I just clicked enter, and I would have just looked at the first two or three options that I saw, and that site came up. And I realized that that site has a lot of, of other manipulatives. And I say that to say, we need to, once we do a search, we'll find like there's so many free applications online, and that's, that, that, that's just one of the many free resources. So yes, indeed, it is free, it's available online, and it is tailored for both the teacher as well as for the, the students. And the teacher can always create the, the sessions for the students, and they can go in and manipulate the resource, and you can see what they have done as well. So I will encourage everyone then to, to go and, and search for as many applications as possible so you can utilize in your delivery to the students. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Aslan. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can allow um, two more questions if anybody else have questions to ask. I'm just checking the chat. Somebody mentioned that, uh, Mr. Edgel, that there is an app version for that um, website. Nothing All right, great. Um, All right. Thank you for that feedback. Um, so, if there's an app version of it, you just go to your Play Store or your iOS stores and from there search for the app and see um, what you can get from it. But it's really a, a good app, a good, a good application. I know it's an application, so I'm thinking that the app will be just as good as the application. And it's called Woot Math, W-O-O-T-M-A-T-H. Okay, thank you, sir. Anybody else um, want to ask a question? Remember, you can, if you don't, if you're shy with the mic, you can also type your question in the in the chat and I'll read it out for you. All right, while I'm waiting, I just want to mention some other things that I saw in the chat. Mr. Edgel, I see your presentation was well received. I see lots of persons saying presentation was good. Thanks, sir. Very informative, informative, great. Thanks for the practical cases. Thanks for, for such information. Very informative, great job. I have learned so much today in this session. Very informative. Lots of great things being said. Um, Rayon McIntosh is asking if someone can share the link to Wootman. He's not seen it on right, the... I, I will share it. Let me look for it and just share it now. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to share in the in the chat um, the, 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 the link to both the, the website as well as I used an online screen recorder to record what I did for the PowerPoint. I just Googled something to, to capture um, screen recordings online free, and that's what I found. So the, the second link would give you the screen capture. 
OK, great. All right. Um, I guess nobody else has much to say, Mr. Edge. It seems that you have given them a, a belly full. I would, nobody wants lunch after this. <laughs> so, folks, um, I want to thank you very much for, for attending and thank you very much, Mr. Edge Hill, for a very good presentation, very informative, and one that I'm sure your participants will certainly take back and, and have an, a positive impact on their students. So, folks, thank you very much for this session. I hope you participate in the others that are upcoming. And take care. Please remember to fill out the evaluation form. OK, thank you. And remember, the next session starts at 12.15, the next set of concurrent sessions. Have a good day. All right, thank you. Take care. Take care.